here we're going to look at a pretty standard, pretty basic household medicine, or household painkiller called aspirin. Now, before we get into aspirin itself, first look at how it sort of came about. Now, many years ago, it was discovered that there was this naturally occurring substance called salicin, and this naturally occurring substance could in fact be used as a painkiller. Now, there are a few chemists who tweak the structure of salicin slightly to produce something called salicylic acid, and it was found that salicylic acid was in fact an even better painkiller than salicin. However, salicylic acid proved to irritate people's stomachs. It, people would ingest it, and because it was an acid, it would really irritate their stomachs, and so although it was a very good painkiller, it wasn't always the greatest. And so, what a few more chemists did a few years later, is they again, they tweaked salicylic acid again to produce something called acetyl salicylic acid. And so acetyl salicylic acid is what we know today as aspirin. So this is our standard aspirin. Now acetyl salicylic acid itself is not in fact a painkiller. However, what we can do is we can take aspirin, we can take acetyl salicylic acid, it will pass through our stomach, and then once it reaches our intestine, it can react to produce salicylic acid. And then uh, the salicylic acid is never in our stomach, so it's never an irritant to us, and we can then absorb it into our bloodstream, and it can act as a painkiller. Now over here, we're going to look at ways we can produce acetyl salicylic acid from salicylic acid. Now here we've got the chemical structure of our salicylic acid. Here we've got the chemical structure of ethanoic acid. So what we can do is if we take a molecule of salicylic acid, we can react it with a molecule of ethanoic acid in order to produce our aspirin. So what we can do here is this, this, these, these molecules react via a condensation reaction, which is also, in fact, an esterification reaction. So as you can see, in green, we've got two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. So they come off, they produce a water molecule. So that's why we call this reaction a condensation reaction, because we're splitting off this smaller molecule here. And then with what's left, we have something very similar to our salicylic acid molecule. So we've still got our carboxyl group up here. However, this time we have an ethyl group or an acetyl group coming off like this via an ester linkage. And so that is why we call it an esterification reaction because we are producing an ester linkage through here. So that is our new ester linkage. So that's that's the why, why there's one way we can produce acetyl salicylic acid or as we can also call it aspirin. So we react salicylic acid with ethanoic acid to produce water and aspirin. However, the problem with this is because we are dealing with an ester linkage here, we know that ester linkages are very vulnerable to hydrolysis. So an ester linkage, if we react any molecule containing an ester linkage with water, then the water molecule can uh, break down the ester linkage and basically what will happen is, in the case of this reaction, the reaction will go backwards. If we react aspirin with water, then uh, this ester linkage will break down and we will produce a molecule of salicylic acid and a molecule of ethanoic acid. And so that means that if we're trying to produce aspirin via this reaction, because we're producing water, the water and the aspirin that we're producing is then reacting, are then reacting together to, to, uh, react, to react backwards. And so what happens is we get a very low yield and a very slow rate of reaction because the stuff that we're producing is then reacting back into our original starting products. And so it takes a very long time and it has a very low yield. So there is in fact one other way, another type of reaction we can use to, uh, to produce aspirin. So here we've got again got salicylic acid. However, over here, rather than ethanoic acid, we're reacting our salicylic acid with ethanoic anhydride. Now, ethanoic anhydride is an interesting molecule. It's produced by reacting two ethanoic acid molecules together. So if I just quickly draw two molecules of ethanoic acid, and so we've got some hydrogens there. If we draw another 
molecule of ethanoic acid. Then what happens, these two molecules can undergo a condensation reaction, whereby a water molecule is produced, so we get rid of that hydrogen and we get rid of this hydroxyl group. We produce a water molecule, and then what happens is we now have this oxygen here still. We've now got that oxygen here still, and so we get this new product, so we get this new product called ethanoic anhydride. So we get what happens is the two bond together like this. to produce our ethanoic anhydride molecule. So that is how, so ethanoic anhydride can be produced by reacting two molecules of ethanoic acid together that produces ethanoic anhydride and a mo molecule of water. So obviously that reaction doesn't always fully occur by itself, it requires certain chemical, more chemical equipment and processes. Uh, in order to sort of suck that, effectively suck that water molecule out of our two ethanoic acid molecules. But here we've got salicylic acid and ethanoic anhydride. And what can happen is again, this is a, a, a condensation reaction. So what's happening is we're reacting salicylic acid with ethanoic anhydride. What we're producing is we're producing some aspirin with the same structure as above. However, the stuff written in green over here is splitting off by itself to produce another molecule of ethanoic acid. So simply we've still got the CH3 group here and we've still got the C bonded to the oxygen however this hydrogen here is coming around onto this oxygen to turn it into a hydroxyl group and now we have ethanoic acid. And So in that way if we react salicylic acid with ethanoic anhydride we can produce aspirin and ethanoic acid. And of course, if we then want to get the aspirin, we have to somehow separate these two products so we obtain pure aspirin. Now, unlike the reaction with ethanoic acid, the reaction with ethanoic anhydride uh, produces a much higher yield because we don't have that backwards reaction effect that we have up here when water is being produced. So this is a much more effective and efficient way of producing aspirin if we react salicylic acid with ethanoic anhydride instead of with ethanoic acid. So that makes this reaction a much better way to produce aspirin. Now, if we want, we often want our painkillers to be soluble, and, and although it is an acid, although it has a carboxyl group, our aspirin molecule here is not actually very soluble in water. So one way we can counter this, one way we can make our aspirin soluble, is that we can convert the aspirin molecule that we have drawn here into a sodium salt. So basically what happens is if, for example, we were to remove this hydrogen here, as in a, a standard a hydrolysis reaction or a standard reaction, if this acetyl salicylic acid molecule acted as an acid and lost that hydrogen atom, then we'd have a negative ion. This whole molecule here would in fact be an ion with one negative charge. And so what we can do is we can re effectively replace that hydrogen that was here with a sodium ion. And so because this is now an ionic compound, uh, we have a sodium ion bonded to uh, an ion that has that was produced from the acetyl salicylic acid molecule. We now have an ionic compound rather than an acidic compound. And so this ionic compound is, like all ionic compounds, uh, dissolvable in water. So basically what's happening is we're really bonding the sodium, at the sodium ion with the, with the other major ion. And so we have a structure that looks like this. We have a sodium ion bonded to this oxygen there via an ionic bond. And so now this is a sodium salt version of aspirin, which makes it, and it is soluble because it is an ionic compound, because it is a salt. So that's a way we can, we can make aspirin soluble. We can change it slightly. We can ditch that hydrogen here and replace it with a positive sodium ion. And therefore, our, we we're converting it to an ionic compound, which is soluble. Now lastly, a new type of aspirin that is being produced and researched is a polymer version of our regular aspirin molecule. So here we've got, we call this polyaspirin. And so the way that this is, the way that the way polyaspirin is produced is we have our acetyl salicylic acid here. 
just as usual. We have our hydroxyl group there. We have another one here. And so in the middle, between these two things, we have what's called a di acid. And so a di acid is basically an acid with a carboxyl group at both ends. So what we have is we have a long chain of carbons in the middle, and then we have a carboxyl group at this end. Then we have our long chain of carbons, then we have a carboxyl group at this end. So this is a di acid. It has two carboxyl functional groups. So what can happen is that we can undergo this can this we can have a condensation reaction here where we split off two molecules of water. So that hydrogen and this hydroxyl group, and the same on this side. And so what we get is we get a molecule of water there. We get a molecule of water there, and we form another ester linkage. So if we draw it, so what we get is this structure here. So we get an ester linkage like that, which is drawn a bit haphazardly there, and we get another ester linkage like that. So if we were to tighten up our drawing, then it would look like this. And then we have this, this long chain of standard, stock standard uh, carbon or CH2s in the middle, and so we just have a chain like that, and so on in the middle. And so now we have two ester linkages bonding two salicylic mole uh, acid molecules to one uh, diacid. And then what can happen here is if we have lots of these monomer units, these can bond together. So if we have another molecule of salicylic acid here, and if this molecule of salicylic acid is really just in the same spot as is in the same spot as this one here. So we'll say that this salicylic acid molecule is in fact bonded via an ester linkage to its own diacid off the page here. So it's bonded to a diacid out here via an ester linkage. What can happen is we can get, in fact get a condensation reaction between these two uh, salicylic acid molecules like this. So if we get, we split off another water molecule there, what we end up with is something that looks like this, we get the two salicylic acid molecules bonded via a single oxygen. And then we can create a long polymer like that. And so that is the structure of polyaspirin. Now there are a few really interesting, really, really good features about polyaspirin that are sort of being pursued. Firstly, polyaspirin, because it's a polymer, it's going to break down slowly. It's going to break down slowly, and that means that if we want to slowly or, or slowly release or control the rate of release of the aspirin of the painkiller into our bloodstream, then we can inject, then we can take ingest a, uh, a specific type of polyaspirin, such that we can control how fast it's released, so we can get a controlled release of painkiller as we require, which can be much more beneficial, and we can get much more sort of controlled and accurate and and useful painkiller or painkilling up painkilling effects as a result of this polyaspirin molecule. Secondly, like other polyesters, this is of course a polyester as it's a polymer made from this esterification li ester linkage. So it's a polyester and like other polyesters, it can be made into a thread. And so if we use polyaspirin as a thread, we can we can use it for stitches and stuff like that. And so not only will we have a, a stitch a type of stitching thread that will break down naturally in the body, but it will also provide pain killing at the site of the stitches. Lastly, not only does polyaspirin have pain killing properties, it also promotes grown, bone growth. So if people have bone or joint injuries, uh, not only will polyaspirin, if applied to the bone, promote bone growth, but it will also kill any pain that is re resulting from the injury. So it promotes bone growth. So now that's that's another third type of aspirin. We've got our regular acetyl salicylic acid, we've got our soluble sodium salt version, and we've got polyaspirin. Now it's interesting to note here, if we look at the regular aspirin molecule, that in fact the way that this is broken down in the body is via hydrolysis. So we know that we ingest the acetyl salicylic acid, it passes through our stomach into our intestine. And there in, it is there in, and out, in our intestine that acetyl salicylic acid reacts with water, it hydrolyzes, 
And that what that water does is it breaks down this ester linkage, just like in the backwards reaction of, of the dodgy way that we can produce acetyl salic acid. Just like when we reacted salicylic acid with ethanoic acid, we produced water and aspirin. And that, wa that water and that aspirin reacted together to undergo a backward or a reverse reaction. So in our stomach, we get this aspirin molecule reacting, not in our stomach, sorry, in our intestine. We get this aspirin molecule reacting with water. We get it hydrolyzing. And what that does is it breaks down the ester linkage. And so what we end up with is we end up back where we started with a molecule of salicylic acid and, of course, a molecule of ethanoic acid. So even if the aspirin is produced via a reaction with ethanoic anhydride rather than with ethanoic acid, when the aspirin is hydrolyzed in our intestine, we're going to end up with salicylic acid and we're going to end up with a byproduct of that hydrolysis reaction, some molecules of ethanoic acid. So that's how aspirin is produced. That's a little bit how it works and its different forms and how our body manages to break it down.